Good evening and welcome to Bourbon Blog Live. Coming to us live from Nashville, it's my good friend, Kerry Bringle. He is the peg leg porker with his famous barbecue restaurant there in the Gulch and also founder of Peg Leg Porker Bourbon. How are you, Kerry? I'm good, Tom. How you doing, brother? It's good to I'm see you. I'm doing great. It's, it's great to be having some bourbon with you here. And as, uh, as Oprah Winfrey once said, there's all these things that are said about you. He's a DGLM, a damn good looking man. Ronald Reagan said that he couldn't have won the Cold War without you. Yeah. And I believe Kenny Powers called me a bulletproof tiger. That's right. You've had a you've had a lot of you've had a lot of compliments thrown your way. It's all on your your business card, which it's there, those are collectibles, aren't they? That's right. Well, you know, it's uh if you get one, you've you've obviously met me. So. <laughs> hey, you know, I first met you at the Kentucky State Barbecue Festival, now into its 10th year in Danville, Kentucky. And right yeah. away, I knew right away you like two of my favorite things, barbecue, bourbon. And then we had a whole lot of fun partying together there, didn't we? We had a big time. I don't think I think that first year that I met you, I don't think I had my bourbon. Uh, we were sponsored by Jim Bean Black. So you and I were drinking some uh Jim Beam Black, which at the time still had the age statement of eight years old on it. Right, right. We were drinking the Jim Beam Black, and then a couple years into it, uh, we were very proud on bourbonblog.com to be the first to review your bourbon. And oh, yeah. uh, and, it, and the line has continued to grow. Your bourbon line has grown. You've released uh, three total expressions of, of bourbon, right? Yeah, so we've got our... Uh, there's the white label, which is a four to six year old. Uh, then we've got our uh, our gray label, which is our eight year old, and that's allocated. Yep. And then our uh, black label, which is our twelve year old, and this is allocated and only released once a year. Uh, that, that that twelve is really it's really uh, hard to find, isn't it? It's, uh, you know, it's, it's not easy to find. It is out there. Uh, but um, if you can find it, I'd say go ahead and buy it because because it's only released once a year. It tends to sell out. And then we get, you know, we get states and, and wanting more of it. And we just don't have more to give them. I understand. And as everyone who is watching is watching us tonight on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, as you're watching, feel free to ask questions down below about barbecue, about whiskey, probably even about life, Kerry Bringle's willing to answer, correct? Yeah, I, I, listen, I'll answer anything, you know? I'm pretty straightforward, so you know you're going to get a fucking right answer when I tell it. <laughs> you certainly <laughs> are. He's not monitoring <laughs> this, is it, are they? What's I that? Kids. You got to be legal drinking age to watch this, so I can cuss, can I? Of course you can. Yeah. I'm All right, good, 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 yeah. It's, this, is the, this is the uncensored hour uh, of, of Bourbon Blog Live, and... Uh, All right. It's the best person to bring on the uncensored hours, Kerry Bringle himself. I, I, I would completely agree with that. But as you guys are watching, definitely ask questions. I know there's a lot of Kerry Bringle fans watching, and uh, and a good time here with Kerry Bringle, the peg leg porker himself. That's the name of your restaurant. Your barbecue business has always been named that. What's the story? Why why are you called the peg leg porker? Well, you know, there's a lot of stories on why I'm called the peg leg porker. Depending on who you ask, they'll tell you. Uh, Many different tales, uh, vicious otter attack. Um, you know, it was a team ritual. We decided on a name. Uh, we decided on a name, Peg Leg Porker, and we were all going to chop our leg off. And I went first, and then nobody else, you know, followed through. So joke was on me. Um, yeah. But, uh, but I, honestly, the real answer time is that I had uh, osteogenic sarcoma, bone cancer. Right. Uh, in the top of my tibia, uh, in my right leg when I was 17 years old. And so I had, uh, I had my right leg amputated above the knee and then went through about eight, nine months of heavy, heavy chemotherapy the summer before my senior year in high school. I'm a very lucky man to be alive. Yes. Yes. And, and I, I've always admired your, just the sense of humor you bring to everything. And, uh, it's it's a it's a time we need sense of humor right now, isn't it, Kerry? Oh, if you don't have a sense of humor now, you you're fucked. You know, it's uh, this is a, not a fun time for anybody. And um, luckily, people are drinking a lot of liquor uh, as they're holed up in their houses. I think I've gone through a lot, a lot of liquor 
What? And, um, you know, but uh, the real estate business is sucking right now. Which, which business is sucking? The restaurant business is sucking right now. Yeah, no, it is. And what? And how? And you've had your place there in the Gulch since uh, 2013. You all have been doing what? Food to go, or what you've been doing? Yeah, we'll actually have our seven-year anniversary Memorial Day weekend this year. Um, we we are doing. We shut down for six weeks, and then now we're back on. We've got curbside, and we've got uh, to go, and then and we did that all last week. But actually, on Monday we were able to open up at 50%. So now you can actually come in and we have to have tables cordoned off and social distancing and our staff is all having to wear masks, but you can come into the Peg Lake Porker now and you can actually sit down and uh, eat you some great barbecue. And as long as everything progresses, then in another two weeks, we'll go to 75% capacity and two weeks after that, hopefully 100% capacity. We really would like to get back to normal. You think you'll be at 100% capacity by by around when? Uh, in four weeks, we hope. That would be great. That would be great. And and yeah. right, but, but at the current capacity, what's it like for a restaurant to be at that, you know, especially one like yours that's very well visited, that's famous, uh, to be at that kind of capacity right now, what's it like? Yeah, it sucks. Um, you yeah. know, we, uh, we're used to being busy. We're used to having a full restaurant. There's a hustle and bustle that's associated with that. There's a lot of uh, you know, it just feels electric in, in yeah. the restaurant when it's full and uh, to have it sort of sit in silent or, um, you know, really slow, it just kind of takes away from the vibe and it's frustrating. And so hopefully we'll get over this and people feel a lot more comfortable getting out. You know, that's what uh, we're hoping. And hopefully we don't have a second wave. And as long as we don't have that, I think that, uh, People are going to get out and they're going to they're going to get over their fears and, and uh, you know, go eat some food, have a fun time. We got to do that. That's what, that's what the Peg Lake Porker has always been about is having a fun time. And much like myself, I mean, you, I go on the road, host whiskey tastings. Uh, I do a lot of events, which I've not been doing, but I've been doing this event every night. Uh, for this, the is this is great that you've been doing this every night. Just kind of a, a great distraction. And uh I'm sure you've talked to a lot of great, great folks. A lot, lot of great folks. And, and thank you, Kerry. And, and that's why I bring it on only the best, just like yourself. And uh, but if you usually are just like me, you're on the road. Sometimes you're at the restaurant, but you're also on the road. You're doing barbecue events across the world. Uh, I'm sure you've been missing that as well. You know, I've been uh, traveling a lot the past couple of years and been on the road quite a bit doing festivals uh, right. in, uh, you know, Denver, uh, Kentucky, uh, St. Simon Island, Georgia, St. Louis, Chicago, New York. Uh, I'm supposed to go to Sweden in uh, August of this year. I don't know what the status of that trip is right now. Memphis in May should be going on right now. It should and, be happening uh, right now, yeah. yeah. It should be happening right now. It's obviously not. They say they postponed it till September, but we'll see if it even actually happens this year. Um, and so uh, – it's frustrating, but it, it, at the same time, I was traveling too much. So this is kind of a little nice break that I'm not on the road so much right now. Um, but we're spreading the word about our barbecue and also about our bourbon uh, when we travel. I, I think we had a, a question here from a uh, scary peeper. Yeah, let me put that up there. I was going to, uh, somebody asking if the bourbon's available in North Carolina. Yes, it is. That's, that is the... Uh, second to last state that we picked up. I actually had to leave Chicago wow. Windy City Smokeout last year and go meet with the ABC board of North Carolina. Met with all of eight minutes. They got, they had, it was an eight minute meeting. I went in to go meet with the board and uh, I said, look here, this is a pig state. I got a pig on the bottle. This is peg leg pork or bourbon. You're going to sell a lot of this. And they picked it up. So yes, now it is available, Scary Peeper. In North Carolina, it has right been there. the last uh, six or eight months. So you can go grab you a bottle at your local ABC store. If they don't have it in your county, then request it and they can pick it up. It is at the central distribution warehouse. As you as you may know, North Carolina is a control state. And so you got to jump through some hoops over there. But um, they've got our white label um, maybe the gray label. I don't know if we've shipped any over there yet, but they do have our uh, four to six year old 
And uh, my buddy Sam Jones, I think, has got it in his restaurant at Sam Jones Barbecue. And um, go out and grab you a bottle. It's available there in North Carolina. You, you got to try it in North Carolina. How many total states are you in now? Uh, we just our last state that we picked up was Louisiana. We shipped yeah. to them two weeks ago. So now we're down in New Orleans and in Louisiana. Uh, the next states that we'll go into will be Georgia and Kentucky. We have already spoken with distributors. Line those up. We're doing the paperwork now. That would put us in a total of nine states. Right now we're in seven states. We're in Tennessee, Oklahoma, uh, Kansas, North Carolina, uh, New York, and uh, Louisiana. I think is that it? Is that did I name them all? That might be it. All right. Okay. I'll even I'll even stick the website up here in a moment so everybody can find you. But somebody's asking. Uh, I, 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 we're, we are going to be tasting some of your bourbon here, which will be great. Uh, someone said uh, great restaurant. Uh, waiting to see what you think of the bourbon. And Amy also said, and thanks for watching, Amy on Facebook. She also said she picked up a bottle of the twelve year old last week. Like the barbecue, barbecue, it's great also. And uh, Good. Well, I'm glad she enjoyed it. We got. Uh, We've been working on a project for the last year and um, uh, on uh, w hopefully within 60 to 75 days, we'll be releasing a commemorative bottle and case of a peg leg porker 15 year old. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that'll be in the next, how soon? Well, uh, we're having the, the, we just did the sign off on all the boxes. Right. Um, we just did the sign off. The, we've got the sample bottle coming next week, but we've signed off on all the graphics. Wow. Uh, it's a great looking package with a great looking topper and a great looking box. It's going to be presentation worthy. It's going to be collection worthy. It will, it is going to retail for quite a bit. It's not going to be cheap, but let me tell you, if you don't have this on your shelf, you're going to look like a chump. In the bar, in the barbecue, and in the bourbon world, you this you don't want to look at chump. You want to want to look at the best looking package in the damn bourbon space when this sucker comes out. Is is the pig? What's the, what's it look like? Can, do you? Uh, it's a black case. Yeah. Gold foil printing. Wow. It's gonna have a different style bottle than we're using now, and there will be a peg leg pig topper on that bottle. It'll have its own pig on top. Yes, it will. Well, three-legged pig on top. Three-legged pig on top. We will be sure to bring everyone the picture, the news, the review very soon on bourbonblog.com. And I was honored. Uh, and that's and congratulations, uh, Carrie. That's that's really um, incredible. Thank you. And, and glad to see you progress in the world of, of bourbon throughout the years. In 2013, you let bourbonblog.com be the first to try. The first bourbon we're going to try. And I was thrilled to be the first to review it. And I loved it. And I still do. Uh, we have the Tennessee Straight Bourbon Whiskey White Label, and I just poured myself some. And uh, that's what I'm drinking right now. Excellent. What uh, what what are we how, how about how old is this? It's a blend of years. This is four to six years old. Mm. So um, this is our youngest expression. Oh, nice. But it's still a great it's still a great expression. You know, um, distilled and aged right here in Tennessee. Yes. As you and I have talked about, Tom, we're a non-distilling producer, so we work with our network of brokers. Uh, and then our process and what makes our bourbon different is I developed a new process where we take the bourbon, we bring it in, and then we de-barrel it. And when we de-barrel it, we run it through hickory charcoal that I've yes. personally burned down into coals. And so we run it through hickory charcoal, and that gives it our unique taste and flavor. And that's a process that we developed. Some folks have copied, but uh, as far as I know, we were the first to filter through hickory charcoal after we debarreled our product, and it gives it a it gives it a great flavor. It's not smoked; it doesn't taste smoky, um, which I don't like. I've never have had a smoked liquor that I like drinking. They're always bitter and acrid. Uh, most people don't know how to do it because they're they know how to make great liquor, but they don't know how to handle smoke or fire. Uh, there's a subtleness to it, and that's why we used hickory charcoal instead of live smoke uh, when we finished off this product. Uh, it's won us 
uh, several medals and um, and it's been a winner for us and we think it's what makes us unique. Well, and, and it's been exciting to see win those medals. And again, the first ever hickory charcoal filtered, right? Is that what happens? The filtration happens. That's correct. Charcoal. Similar to what happens with Tennessee whiskey, but not exactly because you're the first to use the hickory charcoal and you picked out that hickory charcoal yourself, right? That's right. So a Tennessee whiskey goes through the Lincoln County process right. and it's filtered through sugar maple charcoal yes. uh, before it goes into the barrel to mellow it. And right. um, that process has been around for a long, long time. And that's what's made Jack Daniels famous. Right. Ours is different. It's a bourbon with all the characteristics of a bourbon. It's a Tennessee straight bourbon. Uh, but once we de-barrel it, so after it's already aged, that's when we're pulling it out of the barrel and then we're running it through hickory charcoal to finish it. What gave you the idea? What was the inspiration behind the, the hickory charcoal? Well, everybody kept on saying, well, if you're going to do a bourbon, it's got to be smoked or it's got to have hickory flavor or whatever. And I said, look, I hadn't had a smoked drink that I'd give a shit about. I don't like smoked beers. I don't like smoked liquors. I'm not a scotch drinker. Right. Uh, what happens is if you smoke the product or you infuse smoke in there, that those particulates that are pollution, that's the creosote burning out of that wood, they're pollutants. If you smoke into a liquor, like a drink, if you were to use a smoke gun right. and put it into a glass of liquor, it's just putting pollutants and garbage in your drink. And that's where, that's how they make liquid smoke. And, you know, if you've ever had anything with liquid smoke in it, it's too smoky, like a, to eat too many pigs in a blanket or something. You know, you eat too many little smokies. You don't want to eat that shit for another six months because you get sick of that. The smoke is too... It's overwhelming. It's too right. much. It can be too extreme. I agree. So uh, we didn't want to have that effect. I wanted to have something that was very subtle. And so I experimented around with different things. And we experimented with some raw hickory. And then I experimented with the hickory charcoal. And to me, the hickory charcoal just gave it one more step of sort of mellowing. But it also imparted a little bit of that smoky taste without being smoked. Right. So you didn't get the pollutants were already burnt off the charcoal. You're just getting a little bit of that in there. And that that's what I think makes ours unique. And that's what's worked for us. It, no, it is it is very unique. And I think that the, the flavor, you do have a hint of that smoke against the sweetness, uh, like a good bourbon. Uh, someone asking also a question about the mash bills uh, for each of these. Are each of these around the same mash bill as we continue to go up? Are they the same recipe, but at different ages? They're all around the same mash bill. Okay. So similar recipe, just different ages. Just different ages. We don't and want to get too. We don't want to get too damn complicated, you know. Right. Right. What's uh? What's what's the general mash bill? Do you do you know or do you share? What I I want to say we got uh, uh we're at about a sixteen percent eighteen percent rye. Okay. Uh, in this mash bill. Right. Uh, so it's a it's not weeded. Um, not, and there are some nice spicy characteristics. Right. When you were creating this, were you looking for uh, a, a Tennessee bourbon that would complement barbecue food or just all of the above? Is that what you were what you were after? Yeah, all of the above. And as you know, Tom, I worked with Jim Bean Black and still do for right. years, for probably the past 15, 16 years. Yeah. Fred knows a close personal friend. And um, we worked with them. They still sponsor my Memphis and May barbecue team. It's not like we're in any competition for uh, Beam Suntory. They're a huge company. We right. wanted to do something with them years ago before we started this line. But, of course, being such a large company, trying to make a collaboration work is difficult. You know, it's just you got a lot of layers of bureaucracy to try and cut through. And so uh, I was able to run across a batch of Tennessee straight bourbon. And then somebody said, hey, uh, are you interested in this? And I said, yeah, absolutely. I've been wanting to do this for a while. And he said, well, if you want to do this, now's the time. It was about six months after I started the restaurant. Right. So the time was not ideal. I didn't have any extra money laying around. But I knew that if I didn't seize that opportunity at the time, then it probably wasn't going to happen. And so I did it. And we put it out there, and it was met with, uh, with, with uh, a very warm reception. And since then, we've... 
evolved. We've, we've worked on, um, you know, our winning formula and we've entered some competitions and we've made sure we've got the packaging and everything right. And the price is right. That are, uh, uh, that are comparable to other market prices out there. And, uh, We've attracted a lot of attention. We've had several companies come to us that were interested in making a deal, but we never have finalized any deal. We are still 100% independent and family owned and operated. There is no investors behind Peg Leg Pork or Bourbon besides me and my wife and uh, same with our restaurant. So if you're looking for a grassroots uh, one owner, the buck stops here type bourbon, I'm the guy, it, it, uh, and I'm the, uh, I think I'm the only pit master in the world that owns their own spirits company. I love it. You've done a, you've done a great job uh, with, with obviously your barbecue, barbecue and also your bourbon, and uh, the two combined are a winning combination. And I will say that the, this, tell me again, the price point of the, uh, the white label is what? So the white, label, the white label right here. This is going to come in generally at thirty-nine to forty-two dollars a bottle. Beautiful. Uh, gray label right here, which is new. So the white label for a while had the eight-year uh, stamp on it. Right. We had to change that and go back because of just the economics of the business, it was not sustainable. We were losing money, so we went to the eight-year in the gray label. Gray label. And uh, this is going to run in the fifty-nine to sixty-five dollar range, depending on where you are in the country. And then we got the black label um, with the gold foil pig, and it's embossed. That cost me a lot of money, uh, but it looks good. And uh, this 12-year-old has done well, won double gold in San Francisco. Yeah, congratulations. Uh, you know, we've sold out every batch that we've produced uh, very quickly, and um, it's great. But it's going to retail for around $99 a bottle. And for a 12-year-old, that's, and, and, and with the depth that has, it's uh... – all, all great prices, beautiful whiskeys. We're going to try the uh, gray label eight year old next. That's what I have. And I have three different glasses here. I have this in my, my second glass. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to the eight two time. That, excellent. Excellent. And again, if you have any questions for, um, Carrie Bringle, Peg Lake Parker, ask right here. And, uh, we're going to continue sipping and tell us what you're sipping tonight. If you're trying one of his bourbons, tell us, but no matter what you're drinking, Tell us what you're drinking. We always like to hear what people are drinking uh, as we're going about the process. What have you been? You've been drinking some of your own whiskey at home when you as, as during the quarantine. What else have you been sipping on? What do you, What are your favorites to drink on uh, during the quarantine? Any favorites? Me, I, you know, a lot of times, uh, just daily drink that I drink. You know, I drink obviously too much, but uh, I like a, a. We call it a pork and stormy. So we make a drink at the restaurant, which is peg leg pork or white label and ginger beer. And it's a pork and stormy. Uh, I like to drink that as well with uh, Jim Beam Black and also Jim Beam White. I'm partial to Beam. They've been good to me. Uh, they're close friends, and uh, I think they got a great company. You know, we. I also like. Uh, gosh, you know, there's so many great products out there now. Uh, the Dickel products are world class. Yes. Old Forester's great. Oh yeah. Um, I've got quite the collection of a bunch of different, uh, bunch of different bourbons. I tell you here in Nashville, uh, our, our bottling partners at, uh, Pennington distilling have come out with their Davidson, uh, uh, Tennessee whiskey and their Davidson rye and they're both excellent. And so, um, there's just a lot of, a uh, lot of, uh, great, you know, a lot of great bourbons out there nowadays. This is this is like the golden era of bourbon right it now. It really is. No, it's so many good whiskeys and bourbons, and, and so much you can do with them. So many great cocktails at your at your restaurant that we've had and enjoyed. And you sometimes you'll sometimes add a little uh, whiskey in when you uh, when you do barbecue, won't you? I mean, you've, you've you've done some recipes where you put a little little of your whiskey in. Yeah, not many. You know, I don't like I, I like to drink whiskey while I cook barbecue. I don't like to stick much bourbon in my barbecue <laughs> and I don't stick much barbecue in my bourbon. Uh, I'm not big on a lot of cocktails, but um, right. I have been enjoying an old fashioned lately. You know, a right. pork old fashioned has been uh, very refreshing. I like it. That's been my quarantine 
kind of go-to drink. I'm not, quick. I've been doing some old fashions too. Yeah, normally cocktails are a little too uh, frou-frou for me. And I'm not, you know, I'm not too much into them. But during this quarantine, I've, uh, I have to say, I've had more old fashions than uh, I traditionally have had in the past. I, I'm, I'm there with you, brother. I, I like some good old fashions, some Manhattans. Old fashions, very complimentary to, uh, to a good barbecue platter and uh, some nice ribs and it works extremely well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we got Amy. I guess she said she's in Louisiana. Excellent. Uh, she's going to try to find. You should be able to find it here soon. We're distributed down there by Uncorked. Excellent. And uh, you'll be able to find it. My, I've got a lot of friends, and I usually travel to New Orleans about four times a year. I can, I've gone down to go for hogs for the calls and – for Emeril Agassi's Boudin and Beer and uh, Donald Link and the Link Restaurant Group are close, close friends of mine. So uh, you can expect to see our bourbons in uh, in the Link Restaurant Group restaurants, Cochon, Cochon Butcher, probably Herb Saint, Gianna, uh, and Pesh. They should all, all those in that bourbon. Go down there and put a boot up Donald's ass, but I'm pretty sure they're going to pick them up. So... Uh, <laughs> All incredible bars. In yeah. the we try to get there at least once or twice a year. She says she'll be there in two weeks in Nashville. Maybe well. Well, come and see us, and you can have a drink at our bar if you want to sample them. We can't sell you a bottle at the restaurant, but there's liquor stores on both sides of us that can sell you a bottle after you come and have a uh, have a taste with us at the restaurant. Excellent. And we're looking forward to seeing you soon uh, when when things. Get a little different. We'll come down and see you there in Nashville. I'm already tasting on the eight-year-old. The eight-year-old, uh, so it's it's taking it a little older, a little step further, a little more into that barrel and into yeah. that uh, that 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 earth. Des describe the eight-year. What do you do with the eight-year? Yeah, you're getting. I mean, you're getting a, a little more uh, wood. You're getting a little more of that flavor. It's not it's not real oaky to where it's overpowering, but you're starting to taste it more than you do between the four and the six year old. And so once you, when you get into the 12 year old, which you'll taste next, you know, it'll have more wood. Uh, and some people like that and some people don't. So, you know, we have some folks that go out and get the 12 year old that absolutely love it. It's their favorite, but we also have some folks that try the 12 year old, and then they go back to the eight-year-old because they're not as right. fond of the uh, wood, you know, of, of, of as much wood as you get from a 12-year-old right. bourbon. This is um, this is great stuff. I like the, the proof. Is this 90? What's the proof of this one? You know, we've stayed with 90 proof. 90 proof. Uh, with, you know, all the, the, the four to six-year-old is 90 proof. The eight-year-old is 90 proof. The 12 year old is uh, 93 in the 93 or 93.7 range. Right. Uh, we did it a little bit different, um, but you know, 90 proof is generally a bourbon lovers bourbon. Right. Um, I'm, I'm not partial to uh, real hot bourbons. I don't, I'm not crazy about the barrel proofs. They're just too hot. I get heartburn. I generally drink bourbon with a little bit of water because of that heartburn. I drink it on, I'm a heavy rocks guy. I like it cold and I like it on heavy rocks where it can mellow out a little bit and, and where it can do its thing. Bloom it out and, and get that flavor. Yeah. Um, I've been to tastings where they give me 127 proof bourbon and no ice. And it feels like somebody's stabbing me in the goddamn esophagus. I mean, it just is too much. And so, uh, be powerful. And, they, and they're good. They're great bourbons. You know, um, I went to a tasting with, with Drew Colstein and uh, of course we puts out amazing product and Drew has a collection of some great barrel proofs or high proof bourbons. But, uh, my personal taste is that that's very hard for me to get down, um, with my, with my heartburn. It just doesn't, quite go down so smooth and you know everybody asks well how should i drink it well you know and i always tell them drink it any way you damn any way you like it if you bought it drink it the way you like it i don't like to see you mix a 12 year old with some coca-cola 
But you know what? If you pay for the bottle and that's the way you want to drink it, then by God, more power to you. That's your choice. So. That's right. Do it. Do it the way you want to. And and I think that uh, with this, I mean, even from the white to the eight year old, the, the gray label, um, I could see a lot of cocktails with the eight year old. Some nice, nice warmth on the very end of it. Just goes on kind of places in the tongue. Uh, just really beautiful stuff. That that eight year old. That's um, it's a it's a really fun. Fine yeah. eight-year-old bourbon. Uh, I think it's a good product that we've been putting out for a while. Yes. Um, the next batch of eight-year-old that we'll do, I've got barrels right now that we'll probably bottle within the next uh, two to three months. Uh, and it's actually, it'll be labeled eight-year-old, but it's actually nine-year-old bourbon. Uh, you know, it'll have know, some eight plus up to nine. It's eight plus. We don't want to go through the whole cola process of having right. to change the label and confuse yeah. our consumers on what the gray label is. But I can tell you that it's already nine years old. That'll go into our next batch of eight year old. So the next batch will be something very um, spect. And now, when will the next batch of eight year old be on? Uh, I mean, you know, we've still got eight year old in stock right now, okay. so we're still pushing that out. We just sent a couple more uh, uh, cases to uh, Oklahoma. And Kansas, because uh, they're moving through it, boy, they 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 dig it out there. And um, in the next bottling, that's when it'll be the nine-year expression. You know, you you won't know by the bottle, but that's what's going to happen. And um, you know, and then we're we're looking for more twelve-year-old right now. Right now, we don't have twelve-year-old in stock for a new release uh, around November or December, but we're confident that we can probably find some. But you know, I think what's interesting about our process and about what we do and about our brand is that people are interested in the brand and how we take it and finish it. And so, you know, it could be that one year when we're searching for a 12 year old, if we can't find Tennessee, we may bottle a 12 year old Kentucky. And we'll label it as such, uh, but we'll run it through our same process of hickory charcoal filtering, and we may get a new expression that people really enjoy. And that's what's great about what's happening in the bourbon world right now with folks like uh, Barrel Bourbon right. and folks like uh, Bardstown are doing some of these. It's a different expression every time. It's a different blend every time. And... Um, my friend uh, Deadman Dixon, you know, uh, uh, did did his uh, uh, Kentucky Owl. Kentucky Owl. Yeah, always something new. Uh, always something new. He's done extremely well with that. They sold the brand for a record amount, and um, great, great guy. And uh, you know, there's some great things happening out there in the bourbon world. Even my friend uh, Chef Ed Lee has been working with another friend, Trey Zoller. And they've put out some great expressions. Collaborations are wonderful. Yes. Collaborations. Chef, yeah. We enjoy the chef's collaboration a lot. And I, I think it would be fun. I mean, I agree that that people are always looking forward to something new. And and as you put out new products, uh, whether they are Tennessee or Kentucky, whatever it might be, I think people will enjoy them because you've done your special process. You've put and that's what you've done, Carrie. You haven't just uh just just bought not that there's any problem with it. If someone has a, a single barrel or a barrel they love and they blend their own, that's fine. But you've put it through that hickory charcoal uh, filtration process to really put your signature flavor on this. And um, and it's and it works on all these. It really works amazing. Uh, if anyone has any questions, again, for Carrie Bringle, ask them below, tweet back to us. Do you get more and more? I mean, I think that, and, and this still happens, but I think, you know, when I was first in the business uh, 15 years ago when we started Bourbon Blog, uh, people were, um, you know, they just thought bourbon had to come from Kentucky. Uh, more obviously, the Tennessee Whiskey Trail, so many bourbons being made in Tennessee and always have been. But do you get people still asking, oh, it's Tennessee? Is it really bourbon? I mean, do you still have that when, when you meet some people? Oh, we get it all the time. I get people yeah. in the restaurant and they're like, oh, that's not bourbon. Bourbon has to come from Kentucky. And I said, well, you need to look up the federal guidelines. You're 100% wrong. And, uh, you know, that's okay. It's a common misconception. Tennessee can be produced in any state in the country, you know, uh, but uh, it has to meet certain criteria. And uh, Tennessee is no different. 
Tennessee, you know, what's funny is that uh, in Tennessee, a lot of times we always think about most of the majority of brown water coming from Kentucky. However, right. Jack Daniels is now one of the largest whiskey producers in the world. They overtook Johnny Walker uh, in their production a couple of years ago. And when you go international, people think of Tennessee in the same vein as they think of Kentucky when they talk about whiskey or bourbon. Uh, and like I said, in Tennessee, we think of bourbon and we think of Kentucky most of the time uh, because we have Tennessee whiskey. But globally, right. globally the story is very different. And, oh, yeah. Um, and Tennessee is known for two things globally. They're known for Elvis and they're known for Jack Daniels. And so um, Jack Daniels has done an excellent job of uh, telling that story and doing marketing around the world and selling a lot of Tennessee whiskey. Yes. And um, I've always been more of a bourbon fan. My grandfather was actually close friends with Lim Motlow. So I grew up, and when I'd go to visit him in Memphis, all around the house, there'd be these airline bottles of Jack Daniels, and there'd be these <laughs> jurors. And I always ask him, and my grandmother would say, well, you know, Papa and, and uh, Mr. Motlow are, are friends. There was Lim and his brother, Hap Motlow, and my grandfather and Lim were uh, close friends. But when he'd go visit him in Lynchburg, he couldn't give him cases of fifths, he'd have to give him a case of airline bottles because that was the only thing legal for him to give him. And uh, Jack Daniels was a very different product back then. And um, I'm not a, uh, a straight Jack Daniels uh, fan uh, from a taste perspective. It's just never right. been a flavor profile. I've always been a Kentucky bourbon fan. Uh, but uh, Brown Foreman and Jack Daniels have put out some excellent products in the last 10 years that are amazing. They've got a, so many different expressions now. They've done a, a great job. And um, so it, it's it's been interesting to be in this world and, and see the different things going on and having people say, oh, you know, I've been called a faker because we're non-distilling producers. But we've never been, we've never hidden that fact. We've always been very upfront about that. Right. The thing about this business is uh, you need to have a good product, which we've got. Uh, it needs to drink well, which I think ours does. And we've won oh, wow. to prove that. But you also need to understand the market and you need to understand marketing. And a lot of these craft producers get caught in the trap of thinking that people care about non-gmo or this or that and your general because you have a you have a faction of people that do care about that right but the majority of the people in the market don't care about that and so a lot of these craft producers will build a distillery right off the bat and that distillery is never going to be enough to produce what they need to to be viable as a company nationwide uh, unless you're building a large column still, you will never be able to produce enough bourbon to really be viable in a nationwide market. And so we've chosen to go the opposite route. Instead of spending a million dollars building a distillery that will never be big enough to supply a national market, we've decided to be a non-distilling producer until we are large enough or built up a big enough audience to build a distillery. Right, that makes so sense. That distillery, we'll build one that has the capabilities of supplying a national or international market. Right. And that's where we differ from a lot of the folks and that everybody's got to take their own path, but that's the path that we think is correct. So far, it's worked for us. And we've sold most of our product through word of mouth. We don't advertise big we don't have a big marketing budget people either drink it because they love it or and they've heard of it and the nice thing is we also have an outlet with the restaurant where we can hand sell it for people who come in from all around the country to eat our barbecue can try our bourbon and then they can go back to their home state and ask if they can get it yes and that's what works for us like i said everybody takes a different path uh, when we build a distillery 
we will make a heavy investment in a distillery that'll be big enough to supply us nationwide. Until then, you probably won't see us building a distillery with a 500 gallon still. Right. It just doesn't make economic sense for the market that we're in. And you and you may at some point you're, you you leave that possibility open, but for now, uh, I think the plan that you've gone with has really worked nicely for you. Well, I'd love to build a distillery, but you know, again, we're a hundred percent independent. The only person financing this venture is me, and uh, <laughs> and uh, that costs a shit ton of money. It's a lot. It does. It does. And, um, and and you know, if again, if you build something that's just a show still that can't produce enough for long-term market gains, then uh, you've wasted a lot of money that you could be using expanding your market presence. Right. There's a lot of distillers out there. Somebody asked on one of these um, questions, are we sourcing from MGP? We're not, but you know what? MGP produces great product. Yes. Uh, hell of a distiller, they know exactly what they're doing. They can distill in mass quantities. So if you're a new bourbon startup, you can have MGP produce what you want, or you can buy some stock from their stock mash bills and you can manipulate it or blend it the way that you want to be successful. Um, we didn't go with MGP. We went with what we can buy through our brokers source from where we want it to be sourced. Um, but my advice to somebody wanting to start a bourbon company would be, first of all, understand the marketing side and the consumer side and um, what they're looking for rather than, hey, me and my Uncle Joe uh, were interested in bourbon, so we bought a still and now we've come out with me and Uncle Joe's bourbon. You know what? Nobody gives a shit. Uh, if you don't have a story or you don't have any marketing, right. uh, then people are just not, it's not compelling enough for them to go out and spend $40 on your bottle. Right. I think that you, you give some great perspective there. And it's um, obviously everything that you do in the business and cuisine and in, in, in whiskey in, in, and, and, and what you've always done has led up to the point of you releasing this bourbon. And I think it's, um, it's been the wisest way for you to go about it. And and you and someone's asking, you don't really share where you source it from, but we know it's in Tennessee. It's distilled and aged in Tennessee, and I don't get it from Lynchburg, okay? So you can draw your own conclusions. <laughs> if if that helps, and we appreciate all the questions and, and it and it's exciting. People get excited to to learn about the history of the bourbon. But I think what makes your whiskey most interesting is are the picks that you've made. It is from Tennessee and this process you put it through that, that carries through the flavors of all three of the expressions, all beautiful. Now we both have a glass of the 12, right? Got the 12 right here. The 12, I'm nosing it. Taste more wood. Wow. It's a little more kind of right away it has that a lot of wood. I get just a lot of, um, it's a nice sweet, but almost a creamy nature on this. And I was going to say it kind of the end note on the eight-year-old, whenever I get a nice buttery note on a um, an older whiskey, I think it's a really good stamp of a good whiskey. I got a nice buttery note on that eight-year-old. I thought it was really buttery and just really delicious and juicy. I, I think they're both. I think they're both good expressions. Um, you know, look, I, 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 we wouldn't source this product from where we do if we didn't think that it was the best product we could get in oh, our state. Um, you know, there's uh, and and most people don't know there's a new there's a contract distillery in, in Tennessee now that's uh, that's become the third largest distillery in the state of Tennessee. And uh, they're mostly unknown. And uh, we just started laying down some barrels with them and we're excited to be working with them. Um, but, you know, not all. Uh, it's the one distillery in the state of Tennessee that doesn't have its own brand. And they're producing a lot of great bourbon kind of under the radar. And um, so just like we're a non-distilling producer, um, they've become a non-branded producer in Tennessee that are doing great work. And, um, you know, there's, with all the capacity that some of these distilleries have been building up over the past four to five years, 
we may see the tide turn that there may be a glut of bourbon on the market. Right. Uh, I don't know that there will be because the demand still keeps going up and there are foreign markets that are dying for this bourbon. Yes. But the Buffalo Traces, the Jack Daniels, the uh, old uh, Forester, you know, all these, the Heaven Hills, all these major distilleries have been ramping up production. Jim Beam, uh, over the last four to five to six years. And, um, you know, they're going to have the ability to produce a lot of bourbon over the next five to 10 years. Right. And good bourbon. Right. Right. Good bourbon. Right. This is the, and this, this 12 year old is, uh, something so special. Um, it's just gone deeper and deeper and deeper into those characteristics and into that uh, that hickory uh, charcoal filtration. I mean, you're really just getting so much more uh, intensity, but also this there's smoothness. I mean, it's intense, but it's it has that that silky smooth finish, a lot of warmth. I mean, there's a lot of good characteristics, a lot of delicate sugars towards the middle. I get some really nice, uh, delicate, elegant sugars. It's really just so nice. It's a you know time for a you know I like Maker's Mark. I like uh, a lot of uh, 80 to 86 proof bourbons uh, that are great. They're easy to drink. They're very smooth. Ours is a 90 plus proof bourbon. This uh, this expression. I'm drinking a. I'm actually drinking the first batch of 12 year old. I just oh, had wow. my open over here, so it's batch number one. It's uh, 93.9 proof, uh, I think. But one of the things that that charcoal filtering that hickory charcoal filtering I think is done for this bourbon is make that 90 proof very smooth to drink straight. It drinks yeah. almost like an 80 proof. Uh, you don't get any harshness. You don't get any choking you out. It's, um, it, it's really smooth for a 90 proof bourbon. Yes, it is. And um, I think another question is when we're, when we're looking at um, Tennessee, I mean, the Tennessee whiskey trail has really taken off the last few years more and more craft distilleries in Tennessee making great whiskeys. I mean, we've had, I'm just trying to count out of the 50 some episodes we've done, we've had a handful of great folks from Tennessee, just so many great products coming out of Tennessee. Uh, what's it like right now? I mean, obviously to be, to have a whiskey brand in Tennessee and to watch this happening in Nashville around you, the growth of whiskey in Tennessee, what, what's it like for you? What are your thoughts? Uh, you know, I think it's great to see the Tennessee whiskey trail I think it's uh, great to see uh, a lot of these craft distilleries, uh, you know, come up and, and produce some really cool, great product. The laws are changing rapidly in Tennessee, uh, which is a good thing. And um, it's, a, it's a, you know, there's no reason why Tennessee's whiskey trail shouldn't be uh, at least three quarters as popular as the Kentucky bourbon trail which is led by our friend Adam Johnson, who's a great guy. And uh, they do a dynamite job. They've seen that thing explode over the past 15 years. Yep. Um, and, and Tennessee latched onto that. You know, the Tennessee Whiskey Trail was actually started by two guys. It was a private deal. That's right. I remember when they first contacted me. I, it's exciting yep. how much it's grown. Well, it's it's exciting, but there's some there's some – little bit of a twist to it in the fact that those guys started we were on the tennessee whiskey trail on the original tennessee whiskey trail and not that we had a distillery but they put us on there to say they've got a bourbon and go to their restaurant and you could taste it right uh tennessee department of economic development and the state came in they bought it from those guys they kind of i don't know how much they pushed them to buy it but anyway they wanted to take it over with, along with the distillers guild and unfortunately, it pushed people like me out of it. So oh. you see Peg Leg Porker on the Tennessee Whiskey Trail, which is uh, bullshit. But anyway, um, you know, that's you what... Could always, you could always have your own trail, Carrie. We could put you on another trail. It's only distilling producers, um, which I get. I get some of that. But um, it's frustrating for somebody like me that's... Uh, in a lot of cases, outselling a lot of the people that are on that trail. Right. Um, I understand. I and understand. Uh, but it, that, that's the business. That's what we're in. 
Um, and if we do a distillery, then we can be on the trail. Until then, you can come to Peg Leg Porker and you can try our bourbon. And uh, I may be sitting at the bar and I can tell you what's up in Tennessee. <laughs> Well, and the amazing thing is, I mean, obviously we 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 love what all the distilleries in, in Kentucky, so many great ones, but the number of distilleries on the Tennessee Trail is 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 not it's, it's, it's growing. Yeah, uh, there's there's a lot of great labels, a lot of great things going on, yeah. um, some really good product, and uh, I think uh, Pennington with with Davidson's just won Best Tennessee uh, Whiskey. We got our friends over at uh, Nelson Greenbrier doing yeah. some great things. Um, uh, uh, Charlie and Andy are great guys. They and are, yes. They, 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 they did so well. They've, you know, now they've got uh, uh, Constellation brands as uh, bought the majority of Nelson Greenbrier and uh, given them resources to take that great product, you know, nationwide. Um, but that that came from Charlie and Andy uh, busting their ass and going around. And Charlie traveled relentlessly to promote this brand that these yeah. boys didn't even know that their family had started until they went on this little trip uh, to their to their family's former hometown and found out that their family had had this distillery and it had predated Jack Daniels. And so they just They've got Bell Mead bourbon, which you've probably seen nationwide. Oh, it's great stuff. Yeah, they do yeah, great thing. stuff. They've done amazing expressions with the different barrels. Um, but then they've just come out with Nelson Greenbrier's Tennessee uh, whiskey. And it's a good product. Got a bottle on my shelf. And um, amazing story. Amazing guys. Worked their tail off. Really did a great job. And so... We've got several of those in Tennessee that are that are doing it. Pennington is doing great stuff. Uh, they've got Whisper Creek is what they started with, which is a Bailey's type product, but made yeah, with I that. and it's excellent. And then um, they went into their Davidson Reserve uh, bourbon and their rye uh, when they uh, they bought a still from Collier and McKeel, which was another brand started in uh, Tennessee. It's not sold in the States anymore, but I believe Collier McKeel is still sold down in Australia. Right. And Mike Williams started that. And uh, you got Corsair is doing some amazing things. Yes, they've always done some creative uh, stuff. Super, super innovative over there with Derek Bell. And, um, you know, we just have so many in town that are doing some really cool stuff. And uh, it's exciting to see, and it's exciting to see these folks push to change some of the laws to allow some more creative and cool things happening in the state of Tennessee uh, in regards to Tennessee whiskey or bourbon, or yeah. and vodka production, or gin, or whatever. Right? Are there are there any particular um, laws, rules, uh, things that that? Tennesseans can get behind that you think should be more the case for uh, Tennessee whiskey or just Tennessee distilling? Or is there anything you're trying to support yourself? Um, you know, um, we right now we're able to sell drinks to go. I'd love to see that be permanent. That would be nice. <laughs> That'd be great. You think it will be? There is a piece of legislation that um, that's been very controversial, but the young folks are really behind it. Right. Uh, it's, a, it's a legislation that says that there ain't no laws if you're drinking the claws, right? You know? <laughs> <laughs> if you're drinking the white claws, there ain't no goddamn laws, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> the oh, that's great. That one, right? I um, like it. There's some, there's, some, uh, there's some good things happening with legislation, but it keeps changing every legislative session. Um, and... Uh, I'm glad to see the Tennessee lawmakers embrace uh, some of the uh, some of the new things that are coming out. Uh, innovation and new products, I think, will drive this market. We've seen, uh, if you read uh, Mark Brown's uh, liquor report or industry news every day, yes. uh, he really keeps everybody informed on what's going on out there in the national market. And we're seeing drinks like uh, hard seltzer. Really, uh, 
really make a make a stand and and not just a fad um and and if people want to know what's actually going on with that hard seltzer the reason that it's done extremely well is because it tastes just like a vodka soda right but if i were to can a vodka soda it's taxed so heavily that it would cost a lot of money to put on the market and per can it would cost a lot more than something like a white claw or a truly right. they have that flavor down for the, they, for the audience sure. they got the flavor down of a vodka tonic or a vodka soda but they did it with malt liquor through some patented processes that they developed really quite brilliant the taxes are exponentially lower and it allows those drinkers that would normally be drinking that vodka soda or vodka tonic to drink something out of a can, same amount of alcohol, same buzz, same effect, same flavor, but less taxes. And that's where people need to understand how liquor taxes affect what they're drinking uh, versus beer taxes. And, um, those are the laws that are done behind the scenes that really shape the market uh, that um, your general consumer doesn't understand. I mean, you know, most of your, even your distillers don't see that coming a lot of the times, but uh, those types of innovations are what's shaping the liquor market. Now we're seeing some new drinks come on the market like Seedlip um, or Ken that right. are non-alcoholic, but still give a euphoric effect. Right. So they still give you somewhat of a high, but they don't contain distilled alcohol. The non-alcoholic distilled, those are very nice, and I'm seeing those used in more and more bars. Um, and, and and are those some, maybe if you look towards the future, what trends do you see more of those? What else do you see as far as trends happening? I see that as a huge trend. I see the Celsa trend continuing. Right. Uh, gaining steam. You've seen Bud Light go into it, Natural Light go into it. Yeah. Um, you know, and I see, I, I'm all, I think we're going to have some craft breweries fall out during this coronavirus, right. and we're going to see some craft distilleries fall out during this. Um, craft distilleries have trouble finding distribution. They're, if you don't have a recognized name or a serious marketing machine um a lot of times you're going to run into some roadblocks trying to expand into states that they've just simply got too much product on their plate right and they can't concentrate on the smaller guy it all depends how much you're making and where you're trying to go to right i mean if you're making only a small amount very boutique uh to keep up with tourism or a community that's one thing but yeah there's there's going to be some issues hopefully hopefully they'll all survive but i think there are, are many predictions that some of the craft distilleries um either may be acquired consolidate or unfortunately may um may have some trouble i, I hope that's not the case but I'm, i fear it will be there'll be a lot and my biggest surprise of the year tom was peanut butter whiskey <laughs> it was a shocker so I had the guy from Screwball come in. And oh, the founder? My, my bartender was meeting with him. Yeah. I forget who, which guy it was. And right. uh, um, he said, you need to try this peanut butter whiskey. And I said, I, I don't, I don't even, I don't even want to try peanut butter whiskey. Uh, this is a, an abomination. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that I will not like it. And um, I tried it. And I'm going to tell you, it was good. It was, <laughs> hey, it was not, it was actually good. Now, you know, it is what it is. It's a different type right. of product. It's not for your bourbon purist, but it was pretty good stuff. And um, he told me they had been out for, I think, six months and they were selling 20,000 12 pack cases at the time. You talk about taking off. This product has, taken off like a rocket about. it really has and it and for what it is it's beautiful it's it's just flavored so nicely and there are a lot of cocktail possibilities um with it and uh the founder i've, I've met the founder from san diego a uh, really good guy and great story on how he created that and just it's it's a nice flavor i mean i i don't drink it often 
But I think that if you're going to do a flavored whiskey and you're going to do something interesting, do it the right way. It can work exceptionally well for the right audience in cocktails. Um, you know, there's a market for everything. All right. I think, uh, Tom, I think we have a few more questions I'd love to answer if we've got time. Do we yeah, have- no, we have time. I think people are asking about kind of the future of your restaurant is one of them. I think what they can look forward to. Can you keep Can you keep talking for a minute while I go take a leak? Because I, I can. A- yeah, absolutely. Right. <laughs> I'll be absolutely. right. You go right ahead, and I'll keep talking. You go right ahead, Carrie. And thanks to everyone, Adam and Amy and Jason, all the great people watching, Freddie and. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll get someone give a shout out. Uh, James there from Men Who Blog gave a shout out when Kerry comes back. But again, tasting all of these whiskeys. Kerry's so much fun. I, I met him for the first time, and I mentioned this earlier, nine years ago at the Kentucky State Barbecue Festival in Danville, Kentucky, which I highly recommend. I don't know if they're having this year. It's usually in September. But uh, he and his crew, we just had a whole lot of time partying with them the first night and drinking good bourbon, having great barbecue. And I have visited uh, Peg Lake Porker there in the Gulch in Nashville many times. If you visited, tell us down below. I know a lot of you have already mentioned that you've been there, but uh, just just the the people, um, the passion they have for the barbecue, um, such an such incredible recipes from the sides to the ribs, and and the bourbon just complements it perfectly. And someone did ask what my favorite one was. I think all of all three of these are, and I and I had I think maybe the only one I hadn't had was the twelve, but I'd had a couple of these before. Um, I think they're all good for, for the right occasion. I mean, each of these just takes it a little step further on what you're looking for. And I can see how I probably wouldn't do a 12 year old in the cocktail in a cocktail, but you could, I can see how this eight, I'm pouring a little bit more eight, how the complexity and that depth and that barrel could really just spring forward in a, uh, in a cocktail and just do some, some miraculous things in a Manhattan and an old fashioned, but um, they're all just really, really good. Um, so several people joining us there. Um, hope his restaurant is there when we as at okay, yeah. Hopefully he'll be at his restaurant. Hey, Carrie, how how often are you at your restaurant? Amy's asking who's gonna be there in a few weeks. Yeah, if I'm in town, I'm at the restaurant. Yeah. So uh I'm uh, I may not be sitting downstairs, I may be in my office. We built a we added on a great deal, and so we have corporate offices upstairs. Uh, where we built an event space and a uh, second floor patio, but uh, uh, I'm generally here. Yep. Mike, hey, I wonder, before I forgot, my good friend James Hills, who runs Men Who Blog, met you a couple of years ago um, at some sort of Nissan event. He wanted to give you a shout out. Um, Men yeah. Who Blog. So you were doing some sort of barbecue for them. Yeah, we did. Um, uh, I drive a Nissan Titan. I have since they came out with the first one in 2004. Oh, there is the tailgate. Uh, when they came out with the Nissan Titan XD diesel, I bought that. And in fact, Nissan just flew me out to Utah at the end of last year to go do their uh, Titan adventure. And I got to drive the 2020 Nissan Titans. Uh, it was great. I met a lot of great folks out there. But we did that tailgate uh, for the folks trying out the new uh, Nissan Titan XDs when they came out. And uh, we did a tailgate, and then we went up and we hung in their box up there. Yeah, he had a – I remember he contacted me when he was there with you. They had a lot of fun, and they do it uh, – and I, and I join it some Tuesdays and Thursdays. He and Pub Club do a really great afternoon drinking show uh, on a similar format that I'm doing it on. So he wanted to make sure he said hello to you. And, uh, great to hear from James and so many other great people here. Um, uh, yeah, so future of your restaurant. I mean, I, again, in the Gulch, I know it's it's really expanded a lot. What's what are you most looking forward to about getting back? And what are we going to be seeing from the restaurant in the coming uh, months, the coming years? Uh, what are we going to be seeing? Well, the restaurant here in the Gulch has expanded about as big as we are. You know, there's we've always said with peg leg porker, there's one peg leg porker. We're not. We're not building a chain. We're building a legacy. Right. And so if you want to go to Peg Leg Porker, there's one spot to go to. You can now order our ribs uh, and pull pork nationwide through our website and Gold Belly. We ship uh, anywhere in the country. And so if you want to try our product, we'll ship it to you anywhere in the country. Frozen. What's that website? Uh, it's www.peglegporker.com. Okay. okay. And, so we do. Uh, and then we'll have a we got a link a button on there it takes you to gold belly uh where uh we ship out uh our product and gold then, belly. 
we've uh, we've bought a piece of property in an area here in town called the Nations. We'll be opening up a new place, hopefully in September, October. It's going to be called Bringles Smoking Oasis. And so, although it'll be in the Pegleg family, it's not going to be a Pegleg Porker. It'll be much more Texas style by the slice. And we'll have a big, huge open yard. It's an old gas station, kind of be like a Texas ice house with a lot of outdoor area, a lot of cold beer and a lot of frozen drinks. And um, it'll be a place to bring your family, hang out, play cornhole, play bocce ball, and eat some great uh, food uh, and enjoy some family time. So we're looking forward to that. And then we've got a new place that we'll be opening up in the Nashville airport as soon as things get back to normal. And that's going to be uh, another little hybrid called Pig Star by Peg Leg Porker. Oh, nice. Yeah. So um, we've got a lot of great things going on. Uh, we've got our line of smokers that we're doing in conjunction with Sunterra. It's our design that we now are having them manufacture. And um, we've got our food, pro our food product line. We've got Peg Leg Porker Pork Rinds. Uh, and... Um, We've got our clothing. You can go on Amazon and order any of our clothing from our store there, and uh, and and then the new restaurants. So we we're uh, we're 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 staying busy. <laughs> we took the time off from the restaurant to expand into three more states, and so Georgia and Kentucky will be online soon, and then from there we'll probably expand into uh, South Carolina and then maybe Florida. Congratulations on, on all the growth. It sounds like you're many great things uh, ahead for uh, for everything that you're doing in the whiskey, in the barbecue, the smokers. And again, all that can be found on the peglegporker.com, uh, most of the news, or uh, follow them on social media. Also, if you're looking for the whiskey there, peglegporkerspirits.com is, is the place to go. And um, we do hope that uh, everything as you're, as everything is getting opened back up for not just you, Carrie, but for everyone who's in the restaurant and whiskey and bartending business, everybody that watches us, many people in hospitality, you know, we, we're, we're wishing everyone the best. Um, and hopefully everything will be as close to uh, to normal as it can be uh, very soon. We do. Hope. We'll get through this. It, 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 we'll get through this. And it's fun to do things like this with, uh, especially with you, Tom. Thank like you. You, said, uh, you were the first to review Peg Leg Pork or Bourbon. Uh, if you guys hadn't gone back and seen the uh, Peg Leg Porker and Bourbon Blog videos from a Kentucky Barbecue Festival, you need to go watch them because they're funny as shit. They, uh, they are. And I'm going to – what I'll do is tonight is, as, as, we, as we sign off here in a few minutes, I'll post those, whatever channel you're watching this on, Facebook, YouTube, uh, Twitter, I'll post those so everybody can see them. Uh, those were some really fun times. And hopefully we'll be seeing it more of these uh, – these barbecue festivals and you, you add such a great sense of uh, humor and also I think just some some real innovation to the industry with the wonderful product or what and wonderful whiskeys uh, that you have. You know, as we look back, you think on, on COVID and, and just this time in the restaurant hospitality business, um, what do you think we're, we're going to say we learned from this time um, that we've been off and You know, I, I think the, that the companies that took the time to be productive and retool and relook at their business model and diversify are going to be the ones that are going to be successful. Uh, it's going to separate the wheat from the chaff here, you know, with this downturn. Right. And companies that were on the bubble or on the edge uh, are either going to make the right turn and, and, and be successful or they're going to fail. And right. failing is not a bad thing as long as you learn from those failures and become a better business person uh, because of it. I've had many failures in my career, and that's what's made us successful now is the fact that I have failed and allowed myself to fail. But I learned from those mistakes and tried to move forward and make changes to make sure I didn't make those mistakes again. When you continue to make the same mistakes over and over again, that's when you probably ought to get out of business and right. do something else and maybe work for somebody else. So I, I think that you got to look at this time as a learning period and um, and take something away from it. Otherwise, you're you're failing. 
I agree. I think it's a time where we're, we're all learning. We're doing things new. And the, and the new ways we're doing things, hopefully a lot of those will last. Um, much like this show, we pl plan on continuing to do it. And we appreciate everybody uh, watching. Such a such a fun guy and such a great whiskey. And just uh, thrilled to have you on here. Uh, Carrie Bringle, Peg Leg Porker, join us every night. Usually it's 8 p.m. Eastern time that we come to you on bourbonblog.com forward slash live. Just make sure you bookmark this. Let your friends know. You can always be sure we'll have a drink and a story waiting for you because a drink and a story and some great personality is uh, it's the way to spend a good evening, isn't it, Kerry? Hey, listen, Tom and I got some great stories together. I, I can't tell them all here now. <laughs> Watch the videos. Watch the videos. Watch the videos. They'll begin to tell the story. They, they'll begin to tell the story, but they still won't tell it all. It's been fun. That's right. Someday we may release the outtakes. It can happen. I appreciate the support, brother, and uh, congratulations on the success of the Bourbon Blog. Um, we are uh, thrilled to be a part of this tonight and uh, wish you much, much success as you continue to educate the rest of the world on all the different great bourbons that are out there. Thank you, Kerry Bringle. And tell your wife and Dresh and the whole team we said hello. It'll be great to see you guys here in the very new, near future. Uh, and we'll all enjoy some whiskey and some barbecue at your place in the Gulch. Sounds good, my man. Y'all have a great night. Cheers. Cheers.